Wow, it's been such a great time, hasn't it? So far together, and I'm really excited actually about the time we get to spend together this morning. Uh, as I said, we're going to um, have a short bit of talk now, we'll have a break, and then we're going to come back and where we get the opportunity to pray for one another. Because what we're going to look at this morning is the second half um, of what Simon was sharing yesterday. Uh, where Simon was speaking to us um, about the vision that we've got for the church we believe God has given to us. It was this thing of growing in depth, which we looked at yesterday. And I hope you um, took notes. If not, the uh, recordings will be uh, available at some point for you to watch back on because it's so, so important that we get hold of this. That God is wanting us to grow in our depth of and our understanding of who he is, our reliance upon him. And Simon so wonderfully unpacked that for us yesterday. But today we're also now going to look at what it means to grow in breadth. Now, we probably have done a fair amount of growing in breadth just over this weekend. And that might just be the food that we've, uh, we've had. And hey, if that's the application for this weekend, then let's go with that. But we are talking about what God is wanting us to do. What we're going to see. As much as the growing in depth was about us getting down into what God is saying about us and making sure that we are rooted in him. There is also this aspect then of, well, what does it look like? What's it going to look like for us as a church over the coming years? Well, for us, we want to have this vision of us growing in breadth. Now, it may seem a fairly general statement, and I think actually that's quite helpful for us. Because this thing of growing means that each of us individually and also together are seeing small steps. We're not talking about a certain stage that we want to get to, a certain reach that we want to have as a church or as individuals, but our vision, and God's vision for us, is that we will continue to grow in these things. And as we talk about growing, we can understand this in the terms of trees that grow. And there are stages that each tree goes through. It's not always just to getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There will be times when pruning needs to happen. There is a time when there seems to be the winter seasons where things drop off. But growing in breath, growing in this understanding of what God wants us to be and to do, is something that God's going to work into us. As, as part of the vision statement that we put together, we expanded a little bit of what it means for us to grow in depth and in breadth. And this thing of growing in breadth, well, we said that it was us being equipped to see every area of life as an opportunity to obey all that Jesus has commanded us to do. And therefore, be visible witnesses to his resurrection. And importantly, and we'll come on to this in our second session, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because there will be certain things that we talk about now that you may think, oh, I don't know if, if that's me. I don't know if I can do that. Well, that's a good place to be. That's a good place for us to be as a church, thinking, can we do this? And if our answer is not in our own strength, then we're going to rely upon what God is saying for us. Because growing in breath means that we are reliant upon what God is doing in us. As we are growing in this understanding of who he is, we've been so wonderfully um, served this weekend by Simon, particularly yesterday. Growing in a depth of understanding as to who God is. And as we come back to John 15, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles, that's where we're going to spend a little bit more time this morning. Looking at the second half of what uh, Simon read yesterday, this part from verse 12 onwards. Because Jesus so often uses this analogy of things that are growing. 
from the natural world, from vines, as we read in this part here, to trees, to seeds that grow into bigger things. Jesus gives this example to us. And we read in John chapter 15 and verse 12. <coughs> this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So very quickly, just for this first part of my talk, I want us to focus in on what it means for us to love one another. Because if, as we read through John 15, we saw yesterday this thing of abiding in Jesus, making sure that we are drawing our strength from who Jesus is, staying close to him, having his word as the thing that sets our foundation and sets our course. The first thing that Jesus then says to his disciples as he's talking about that is, therefore I give you this commandment, to love one another. And for some of you, that may be a very obvious thing. For many of us, myself included, we're thinking, is that it? Surely there's all this other stuff that you want us to be doing. Surely there's loads to be doing out in the world. And yes, we'll come on to look at that, what Jesus says. First and foremost, he says to his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So this thing of us growing in breadth, us being equipped to see every area of our life as an opportunity to obey all that Jesus has commanded means that we take words like this particularly <coughs> carefully. Because we're called to love one another. And in some ways, weekends like this, it makes it easier. We get to spend time together. You get to start to learn about other people's stories. We grow in love for one another. But this is an ongoing thing. There are going to be times, and there may already have been times, when it's difficult to love one another. I know there's times when I've probably made it difficult for you to love me. <laughs> Decisions that we make, things that we do, mistakes that we make along the way. We are called to love one another. And the practicality of what that looks like for us is that we lay our lives down for each other. We find out what's going on in each other's lives. We maybe have to lay down our own priorities, our own comforts, our own ambitions in order to serve and love one another. The joy that we have in the fact that as we grow in breadth of loving one another is that it includes all of us. You will receive love as we hear these commandments from Jesus. As he says to all of us, love one another. It's not just that you're going to be constantly giving out and receive nothing. The joy of how Jesus has brought his people together is that love is going to be shared amongst us. But we need to turn our mind to look at what other people need. But what does it look like? What does loving one another really, really look like? Because it's sometimes easy to make sure that we are loving one another in the hour and a half that maybe we see each other on a Sunday morning. We gather together, you may get a chance to chat to someone before the meeting, we have a time of worship, we hear the word preach, we then chat with someone afterwards and we feel, yes, I'm loving someone. <laughs> <laughs> well, loving one another means more than that. It means that we give ourselves to one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 gives us an understanding of what love is. And if you're thinking that love is just a case of being nice to somebody, not offending them, 
try not to say the wrong thing or just find out about them, well, that's not quite there. Because love is patient. I'm sure it's not the case that anyone here finds anyone else annoying or has done things that uh, they find <laughs> difficult. But love is patient. Love is kind. Choosing to think the best of one another. Loving one another means that we do not envy. That's such a difficult thing within a community, isn't it, at times? There may be certain things you look at in other people's lives and go, I wish I had that. I wish I was like them in that way. Or look at how things are going for them. Their family, their job, or their housing situation. Love doesn't envy. Equally, love doesn't boast. Love doesn't put things in front of people in a boastful way, lifting yourself up. Love isn't arrogant or rude. As a community and as a family of God, love doesn't insist on our own way. It's difficult sometimes, can't it? Because we all have our own preferences. We all have our certain ways that we like things to be done. But thinking the best of other people and thinking about what they may want. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love keeps no record of wrong. These are all things that we need help with. And we're going to pray for one another at the end. Displaying love for each other as we pray God's blessing on each other. But love doesn't keep any record of wrong. Love doesn't delight in evil. It rejoices in truth. I, it's one of those things that I'm really, really grateful for this church. For you, when I talk about church, I'm talking about me. <laughs> People here, it rejoices in truth. Our times of worship together, our times when we pray together, our times when we're just talking about one another, there is this sense of rejoicing in truth. We are so wonderfully served by our life group leaders who are able to teach us. We're so wonderfully served by preaching on Sunday. We're so wonderfully served by those who bring gifts that point us back to truth. The fact that we have Bibles open when we're worshipping, we're rejoicing in truth. We want to keep doing that. It's something I believe we need to continue to do. As things get more and more difficult, as Simon was showing, uh, explained to us yesterday, the sense of even standing on truth is going to become more and more difficult. We need to rejoice in it. We've used the phrase, we want to be known for radical truth and radical love. Well, ultimately, we are being known for truth and love. But it's helpful for us to understand that our definition and our, and our application of truth and also of love, as we read in the Bible here, is going to become more and more radical in the sense that it will be different from what is seen in the world. And even the love that we have for one another is going to be different from what we see outside. Because it's not self-seeking. Because ultimately it is putting other people first. I'm sure you've got groups that you, and friends, friendship groups outside of, of church that you see wonderful things happening, they are nice people to one another. But over a long period of time, there are situations where we are going to be different in the way in which we love one another. Because we are able to bear with one another. We're able to see what God is doing in people's lives and encourage each other. Love protects. Love trusts. Love hopes. Love perseveres. And love never fails. Wonderful truth is that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and it's great that we reflect upon that. When we think about what it means to love one another, it does mean that we protect each other. Looking out for what's going on. There will be times, I'm sure, coming up in the future where there will be people in this group here who come up against opposition, particularly maybe in their job settings. If we're standing on truth, we need to be those that 
love one another by protecting, getting alongside, taking some of the flack. If people, if you see people under pressure, under attack, maybe from the enemy, from voices coming in from outside, love protects, love trusts, love hopes, love perseveres, and love never fails. So as we continue to give ourselves to growing in breadth by loving one another, it does mean that we will serve one another. And we have the wonderful example, as we know, of Jesus. Please make sure you continue to be reading through the gospel accounts as much as possible. Because we see what Jesus is like. We see the way in which he served, the way in which he loved. Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Jesus <coughs> sticking with these guys for those three years. Even when they're asking silly questions. Even when they don't understand what he's doing. Even though he's made it plainly obvious to them at many points, Jesus serves them, loves them, provides for them as they go around. Have you, have you ever thought about what it was like for those three years as they were going around? As a group of people said they had no place to, to stay. Day by day, what that meant, hour by hour, we've been wonderfully provided for with the food here. They've been going around, probably not knowing where they're going to end up that evening, where that food's going to come from. Jesus provided. They loved one another. You get the wonderful accounts of where it talks about the, the women that went around with them that would just provide the points. The day-to-day -day reality of what it looks like to serve one another. And also, as we look to grow in breadth and loving one another, it's so important that we understand that praying for one another is vital. Again, we have the example of Jesus, just a couple of chapters on from where we are here in John 15. John 17, we have Jesus praying. We have it written down for us as to what Jesus prayed. Now, this wasn't the only time that Jesus prayed for his disciples. We see many other times where Jesus withdrew and was with his father. He would have been praying, I'm sure, about what's coming up, what's going on in his, in his disciples' lives. We need to be those that are praying for one another, praying with one another. We can sometimes find it easy to say to someone, yeah, I'll, I'll pray for you. And I'm sure that, and I thank God that many of you will go away and actually do that. But also there are times when we need to pray with one another. So some days are a good opportunity to do that, but please do find the other opportunities throughout the week. I really appreciate the love that I've received from you as a church over these last couple of weeks, um, as we as I'm visiting my mum having been in hospital over this time, and also the the times that I've spent praying with people here, it's been great. Thank you so much. Please do that with one another more and more. I love our little life group on a Thursday morning. We meet down in the community centre. We get the opportunity, and Alan's wonderfully led us by saying actually the first thing we want to do is just to share and then pray for one another. We're not going to wait till the end. We're going to get into all the discussions. That's great. But now we want to pray for one another. To find out what's going on in people's lives and then pray for one another. That's a way in which we love one another and grow in breath. We're going to need God's help in all of this. And we're going to have time afterwards to pray for one another, to pray for a filling of the Holy Spirit to help one another. Because as we grow in breath, it's going to mean that we're going to possibly find ourselves a little stretched as more people join us, as more people come into this setting. We're going to need to make sure that we are reliant upon the Holy Spirit to help us to be able to love the new people that come in. Not everyone is going to be like you. Not everyone is going to have the same interests as you. There will be certain people you get on with probably a little bit better. That's great. But a defining characteristic of the people of God is that God gathers together people from every background. And brings us together in an understanding of who he is and therefore we love one another because
because we have experienced the love of God in our lives. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, it says this, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Keep loving one another earnestly. It's going to take effort. It's going to take a ply of our minds. It's going to take an understanding again of who God is, what he has done for us. Since love covers a multitude of sins. What an amazing truth that is. In some ways it's quite hard for us to get our head around. It's something God does, God forgives sins. But as we love one another, as we are patient and kind, as we don't envy, as we don't boast, as we rejoice in the truth, as we trust, as we hope, as we persevere, it covers over many things that we're going to do that will hurt one another. But ultimately it gives God glory as we grow in breadth of loving one another. We're going to come after our break to look at well, what does it mean for us to grow in breadth as a church by reaching out to those around us. And we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at some specific things that we can be doing. And I want us to be uh, looking at how we are reaching out to other people. But let's not forget this first point. Growing in breadth means loving one another. It means giving ourselves to one another. Let me just pray for us in this before we finish this first session and then we'll come to um, our break and then we'll go into the next part. Father, we thank you for all that you've been saying to us this morning. And we thank you that as we've looked to you, as we've rested in your grace, as we've looked to your mercy, as we have looked upon the cross, we thank you that that is the ultimate expression of love. And therefore, as we look to how we can love one another, we have a perfect example in you, and we also have help of the Holy Spirit in doing this. So Father, now as we, uh, have, as we reflect upon this, we ask for your help. Or we acknowledge our failures, we acknowledge our limitations, we acknowledge our inability sometimes to, to love one another. Father, as your people, we want to be those that are witnesses to who you are by the way in which we love one another as a church. And Father, we continue to seek you and say, would you add to us? Would you send more people in? Or that we can then love them? So that you would get more and more glory. And Father, we look to you and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Amen. Amen.